Good evening and welcome to a very special edition of Richard French Live. Today, April 21st, is Holocaust Remembrance Day, and tonight we will focus our entire program on doing just that. The period between 1938 and 1945, when Nazi Germany, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, exterminated six million men, women, and children for the sole reason of being Jews. But millions also survived the horrors, went on to start families, businesses, and help their new communities thrive. Their stories over the decades since have reminded us of the ultimate triumph of good over evil. But those eyewitnesses to one of history's darkest chapters, they're vanishing before our eyes. Like the veterans of World War II, old age is robbing us of their voices. That's why we are devoting this half hour of RFL to the message of never again. We will take you to the two events in our region where survivors are still telling the stories that must be told. And we'll be joined here by three generations a survivor, his daughter, and his grandsons. And we'll hear how the Holocaust has resonated for one family throughout the years. And as the number of those who can tell their personal stories now dwindle, the need to hear them has also only grown stronger. Anti-Semitism, it is once again on the rise in Europe, along with outrageous statements from some Middle Eastern leaders that wouldn't sound out of place in a Nazi rally. <laughs> که امروز پرچم داره اون در جهان حزب سهیونیست و تفکر سهیونیستی است. اونها با قلبه بر مراکز اصلی قدرت سیاسی و مالی و رسانهای جهان خواسته های خودشون رو که چپاول ملت ها، تحقیر ملت ها، انهدام ثروت و فرهنگ ملت هاست رو به همه تحمیل میکنن. Even when you take extremists like Ahmadinejad out of the equation, there are worrying signs in the air. Just like in the early 30s, the global economy, it's in shambles. Millions of people now out of work, they're angry, and some just want someone to blame for all their troubles. Here in the U.S., that anger it has mostly been targeted towards illegal immigrants, and it's been strong enough to kill any attempt at meaningful immigration reform. But old fears and beliefs, they die hard. Earlier this month, Richard Poplowski gunned down three Pittsburgh police officers with an assault rifle. He was a frequent visitor extremist in neo-Nazi websites, and as his grandmother tells it, his reasons for shooting sound disturbingly familiar. He believed that, you know, government is government, but there's somebody up there higher for the government, which are a lot of Jewish people that have money, which want to just strip people of everything that they had in the good old American life. When fear and uncertainty take hold, the ignorance and old bigotries, as you just saw, can too frequently crawl out from under their rocks. We as a society can't just dismiss, especially now, these rantings as simply the lunatic fringe. So the most effective response, we believe, are the powerful stories of those whose lives were ripped apart by evil but still somehow survived. Our own Andrew Whitman, he synagogue service in our region last night where those who survived the Holocaust and are still with us to this day came forward to speak. He joins us now with their powerful stories. Well, Rich, three separate Jewish temples came together at the community synagogue of Rye in Westchester County last night. The 11th year these groups have assembled to remember the past and teach the lessons learned to the community's future. Several hundred people gathered for the somber ceremony to hear from Jews of all generations and to learn from one of Judaism's darkest eras. As Bergen Belsen had been a concentration camp, there was only a small and not enough space to cremate the bodies. So the bodies became piled up and the children sometimes played between them. The sight of the piled up bodies is really never out of my mind. Suddenly there was a loud knock on the broken front door and when I went to open it, there stood the mayor and the chief of police. We want to see Mr. Hubert right away, they demanded striding in uninvited. When my father emerged, the police chiefs announced abruptly, Mr. Hubert, 
You are under arrest. You will come with us. They had no arrest warrant, as none was needed to arrest a Jew. The only crime my father ever committed was being born a Jew. As they reached the front door, the mayor turned and announced in a commanding voice, you will all clear out of Kronheim of next month. I want this village to be Judenrein by then, free of Jews. That night, when I came back to my room that I shared with my mother, I told that I was escaping the next day. I told her, Mamala, I've arranged a hiding place for you. My mother's reply was, as always, Berala, I live my life already. She was 43 years young. All I want is for you to survive. It was a long, long night, the last night with my mother. I loved my mother very much, but I could not help her. As I walked towards the elevators, I was asked to take a card from the stack by the elevator. This piece of cardboard tells the story of a victim of the Holocaust. Could it be the story of my great-grandmother Mindel or my great-grandfather Isaac, who were both shot by Nazi soldiers while hiding in the forest near Lancet, Poland? In all honesty, I couldn't speak for a good 20 minutes after experiencing it. Some of the things I saw were just so scary on so many different levels. Some of the things were so incredibly horrifying. The one I can remember most vividly was a two-story room that had a skylight on the top. All along the walls were pictures of the victims of the Holocaust. There was not the tiniest amount of space in those walls, and yet I'm sure that all those pictures are only a slight representation of the number of deaths of that hard time period. The stories that we heard here tonight. And dear God, while we no longer have Warsaw, Vilna, Kovno, Lodz, Berlin, Paris, or Amsterdam, we do have the stories, and offering them must suffice. Uh, it's, I was a kid, and I remember it very well, even talking to you now. You know, I feel uh, going through. And I do can tell you that there is not a day of my life is something that triggers the whole of course, that I remember. That, and also I'm thankful that I'm here, that I can talk about it, that I can tell it. The 614th commandment is to choose life and to not grant Hitler a posthumous victory. So by gathering this evening, especially with this next generation, um, we are enacting that 614th commandment to make sure not only that we never forget, but that we choose life and that we don't grant uh, the Shoah a posthumous victory to allow the next generation to be able to take those stories, to move forward with them, and to redeem and change the world. Well, tonight we heard a lot of stories, and I think we need to continue telling those stories again and again so that they become part of each of us, so that we can continue to tell those stories when the survivors have passed away. Of the 1,600 people who had been on our train, 500 died during the weeks, among them my mom. She had been 36 years old. I have missed her every day. As you saw, last night's service featured multiple generations of local Jews. When the service was first held 11 years ago, the speakers were mostly just the survivors. But like in all Jewish communities, their numbers are shrinking rapidly, making the generation-to-generation -generation aspect last night that much more important. Rich? Thank you very much, Andrew. And coming up next, we're going to take you to the Holocaust Museum in New York City, where the children and grandchildren of the survivors took center stage. <laughs> 